Main title, He Emptied Himself. Subtitle, The Divinity of Jesus Christ. And let me begin by reminding you where we've got to so far in this course of study. My lecture course was announced as a series of contemporary studies in the eternal gospel. And my overall purpose in these nine sessions, these five sessions, I'm sorry, is vindication and restatement of the old, true, apostolic gospel in face of questions, uncertainties, and alternatives that are being canvassed at this present time. I took the phrase from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we preach Christ crucified, as Paul's way of summing up the gospel and as a very convenient text for my own restatement of the gospel. What we are seeking to see in these five studies of different aspects of the gospel is the full meaning and the deeper implications of that phrase Christ crucified as a summary of the gospel message. In our first lecture, those of you who were here will remember, I made the point that the phrase Christ crucified points to the central fact in a many-stranded story about the living God in history, saving men, and ultimately renewing this whole world order. I urged that the gospel is story, history, not myth. I said, is a product of the human imagination, significant because as a story, it gives understanding of ourselves and of our lives, although it's not necessarily factual. That is the sense in which modern scholars in a whole series of disciplines, understand the nature of myth. The gospel, I urged, is not myth in that sense. It is precisely revealed truth taught by God, taught by God to the, to the apostles through the Holy Spirit given to them, and taught by the Holy Spirit through the apostles to us via the written testimony of the apostolic writers in the books of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, though different categories and vocabulary are used by different persons, the witness to the gospel, the witness to Christ crucified at the heart of the gospel, proves on inspection to be one. The lines converge. The message is a single message. And the message is that that historic cross, 26 AD was probably the year in which it took place, is an event of transhistorical significance and indeed of transhistorical reality. For the New Testament obliges us to affirm boldly that folk who come to faith in Christ are touched directly by the cross and by the resurrection involved in it, according to Paul's line of thought in Romans 6, we are crucified with Christ, we are raised with him, we come to be involved in that central momentous event, event of God's plan for the renewal of his world. And part of the message is that the Christ who died and rose and who now touches our lives is in truth the living Lord. He's there in the sense in which Francis Schaeffer spoke of the God who is there. And as the Christ who is there, he's here, very present to bless those who turn to God through him. He reigns, he will come again, he will bring in the new heavens and the new earth in person. He is the living Lord with whom one day all men will have to reckon. For one day all men will meet him as judge. And he is the living Lord whom the gospel now invites us to receive as Savior, the Christ who was crucified on Calvary's cross so long ago. 
And so we begin to counter this suggestion that the New Testament theology should be understood as myth. And we continued to counter that suggestion in our second study two nights ago, sorry, last night as you were, when we looked more closely at the so-called humanitarian Christology, which is precipitated out of the whirl of thought which begins in the minds of many of these modern teachers with an insistence that New Testament theology has the nature of myth. When the smoke has cleared away, what the humanitarian Christol Christologians are left with is a Jesus who was a prophetic man, indwelt by the Spirit, living a life of unique godliness and unique power to influence those who came in contact with it. But his significance for us is precisely that of an example and a teacher, not the significance of a sin bearer, not the significance of a risen Lord, not the significance of a mediator to be worshipped, not the significance of a friend to be loved. And there is no objective atonement, according to these men, any more than there is an objective resurrection. We looked at this view and we saw that it represents a denial of the New Testament message rather than an interpretation of it, which is what its own proponents claim. We saw that it does not fit at all the historical evidence concerning Jesus and Christian origins. And we saw that it flagrantly disregards that which is the main, the united thrust of the New Testament theologians when they speak of Jesus the man, namely this, that the clue to understanding him is to realize that he is in truth the Son of God who took flesh and blood and was made man in order that he might save men. And the New Testament insists, we saw this in Hebrews, we could have studied it equally in Paul and in John. The New Testament insists that the humanity of the Son is integral to his ministry of mediation and redemption in the sense that had he not been man, he could not have done what had to be done in order to save us. And we saw the writer to the Hebrews spelling that out in terms of his key category of our Lord as the great high priest, appointed by God to have both a Godward and a manward ministry, a Godward ministry of making sacrifice for men's sins, and this great high priest of ours offered himself his own blood as the sacrifice for our sins, and then on the other hand, the high priest's ministry is to sympathize with, understand, and so help men in their needs and their troubles. And only a fellow man, says Hebrews, can do that. So the high priest had to be human as well as divine. And the humanity of Jesus Christ is now seen as part of the mystery, the glorious mystery of divine action for our redemption. And this brings us to the subject of this evening's study. In this third lecture, what we're going to do is examine a hypothesis about the incarnation, which is offered indeed not as a challenge to the Bible account of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in the way that the myth hypothesis was, but is offered rather as an attempt to explain certain features about it. The order of topics we're going to follow is this. In order to tune up our minds for what's coming, I shall begin by setting up a danger sign and warning you against speculations. Second, I shall prepare our minds yet further for what we're going to, ex for the theory we're going to examine by illustrating a little further from the New Testament 
its declaration of Jesus' divine identity. There are two passages that we shall briefly look at. Then thirdly, we'll examine this hypothesis, the so-called kenosis theory of the Incarnation. And I shall round off with a brief remark under my fourth heading, a brief final comment on the divinity of Jesus and the Gospel. So that's the order we're going to follow. And to our first heading, speculations. There are two things that I want to say here. It's very important, I think, that as we approach the study of so high and holy a mystery as the incarnation of our Lord, we should make this point to ourselves and make it very clearly. It's a point which I make by the two statements following. One, theologians should not trust speculations, but two, theologians must form hypotheses. Uh, let me explain. First, theologians should not trust speculations. I'm using the word speculation here in a quite precise sense. I mean by it an educated guess which goes beyond the Bible. I think it very important that we should realize that all we can know of God in his own nature and in his plans and his purposes and his redemptive action is what the Bible tells us. And beyond that, we creatures are in no position to penetrate by guesswork. Martin Luther once had to chide Erasmus. Erasmus, uh, a speculative theologian, one has to call him. The rebuke took this form. Oh, Erasmus, said Luther, your thoughts of God are too human. And if we allow ourselves to speculate beyond the scripture concerning the redemptive purposes of God, well, the same thing for sure will have to be said of our thoughts too. We shall, without realizing it, make God in our image. We shall, without realizing it, assimilate him, our creator, to us, his creatures. And that will be a mistake, and the thoughts which involve that mistake will be mistaken all along the line. No, what we must do is to recognize that we are shut up to learn of God in his redeeming action from the scriptures. And the business of theology is to echo the scriptures, to confess the faith of the scriptures, by circumscribing and articulating the mysterious realities of which the scripture speaks. Again, when I use that word mysterious, or when I use the corresponding noun mystery, I'm using the words in a quite precise sense. When I say mystery, when I say mysterious, I am referring to a reality of which we know from scripture and of which we have to say, as we have to say, of just about all the divine realities revealed in Scripture, we can be sure that it is, because the Bible tells us so, but we cannot conceive how it is. At that point, we have to confess the reality transcends our understanding. We know that it is, we don't know how it is. The realities of God, you see, all of them are incomprehensible, to use the technical word again. They are, I mean, above us, above our reason, not unreasonable, no indeed, but transcending reason. And our knowledge of them can only be partial. As we follow the scriptures, the scripture teaching and embrace it and assimilate it, and make it part of our own thinking, well, we grasp truth. Our knowledge of these things is indeed true as far as it goes. But we can be sure that it's incomplete. Of all our knowledge of these divine realities, we have to say, here we see 
as in a mirror, darkly, obscurely, imperfectly, and incompletely. That doesn't mean that we have to be skeptical or agnostic. No, indeed. For what we do know, because God has shown it and told it to us, is amply sufficient for a fully satisfying relationship with God, as indeed Christians have known right from the very beginning of Christianity. And one can illustrate that by saying that in a human family, father can be a genius, an Einstein, and his son may be is only three or four years old, and his son won't begin to grasp all the profound thoughts that are buzzing in his father's mind, but nonetheless, the, the, the boy can have a perfectly fulfilling love relationship with his father if his father loves him and if his father cares for him as a good father will. And similarly, we can know God in love and fellowship, even though we do not know and cannot know all the things about God which God himself knows about himself. When one thinks of the great doctrines of Christianity, the Trinity, the attributes of God, his sovereign providence, the incarnation, the atonement, union with Christ in death and resurrection, we see straight away, first of all, we only know anything about these things from the Bible, and second, we only know these things in part. There are many questions, that is, that we can ask about them which we aren't able to answer. We only know what the Bible tells us, and that means that these things remain mysteries to us in the sense defined. Speculations are attempts to think about these matters beyond the bounds that Scripture set, sets and beyond the sure ground that biblical thinking gives. Calvin, on the subject of predestination, laid it down at the beginning of his treat treatment that one must not go a single step beyond the clear teaching of Scripture or else one will get giddy and fall into the abyss. And what Calvin said of predestination can be said, I think, of all the mysteries of God with which the Scripture deals. If we speculate beyond what the Bible actually says, we get dizzy, we fall into the abyss. So I warn you, brothers and sisters, as I warn myself, theologians should not trust speculations. But the balancing truth is this, that theologians must form hypotheses because this is how theological knowledge is extended. There's a parallel here with scientific method. In generalizing, on the basis of the data available, what scientists do regularly, each in his own field, is to go beyond the data in forming a hypothesis, that is, a notion of how it might be, a conception of what possibly is true, and then having formed the hypothesis, the scientist proceeds to test it by seeing whether it squares with all the data that he's got at the moment and whether he can find other data that tends to prove it. And similarly in theology. Theology is a science. Theology is the study of the revelation of God. Theology too is the, the gaining of knowledge, in this case from what God has said. Theologians form hypotheses concerning the great realities of which Scripture speaks, and then test those hypotheses by asking questions of Scripture to see whether the Bible does in fact speak in a way that accords with the hypothesis or whether it speaks differently. Only as you put hypotheses to the test in this way can you discern whether in fact they do clarify and crystallize scripture truth, or whether they have, in fact, no better status than that of speculations which the scripture won't support. 
hypothesis as such is not a speculation until it has been tested and until you have discovered that the Bible won't support it. If you hang on to it then, speculation indeed is the proper name for it, and you've made a mistake in your method, I would urge, and you're abusing your own mind. That the theologian mustn't do. But he'll only get on as he forms hypotheses and tests them out. I say this because we are going to consider one such hypothesis, hypothesis and what we must say of it is that it was not illegitimate to form it, not illegitimate to try it out. The question is whether it's wise to hang on to it when, as we shall see, there is so little, there proves to be so little scriptural support for it. But more about that in just a moment. I had a second preliminary section, a second preliminary heading, the divinity of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, I wanted to bring before you yet more of the New Testament evidence concerning the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you precisely from these two passages that I'm going to quote, how the New Testament, in its witness to the fact that Jesus is to be honored and worshiped as the Father is honored and worshiped, for he indeed is co-eternal with the Father and shares with the Father and has shared with the Father in the work of creation, just as now he is with the Father in the work of redemption. In presenting that truth to us, I want to show you that the New Testament focuses specifically on the thought of the Savior's pre-existence as the second person of the Godhead who was there with the Father before he became man. I want to show you this first from the prologue to John's Gospel. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the few minutes that I spend on this, I shall not be attempting to offer you a full exegesis of this passage, but I do want to show you how the thought progresses within it. Its thrust isn't always appreciated, even by the best commentators. We should understand it, I urge, like this. The aim of the prologue is to introduce the person and the ministry of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. John's special concern throughout the Gospel is to show us first who and what Jesus was, and indeed is. This is a concern to show us his glory as the Son of God, and to show us, secondly, what is the nature of the grace and the truth that he brought. To show us the nature, the nature that is, of Christ's salvation. And he has a problem. He wants to make sure that none of this is misunderstood. He wants to ease into our minds clearly, unambiguously, and right at the start, the notion that the person of whom he's speaking is the Son of God in the full Christian sense of that phrase, the sense which he wants to expound. And he wants us to understand that it is, in truth, a divine person who came to bring us that grace and that truth which saves. And he knows that that phrase, Son of God, in the minds of many of his readers, will convey some, uh, immediately something a great deal less than what it conveys to his mind as a Christian teacher. He knows that to Jews, Son of God is a phrase that need be no more than an honorific title for the Messiah, and that to the Gentile, the phrase Son of God will suggest, most likely, uh, one of these heroes of Greek mythological legend who had a human mother and a divine father. And he doesn't want to allow anyone for one moment to think that Jesus Christ, the eternal divine son, is like, say, the hero Hercules or someone of that sort. 
So he doesn't begin by speaking of the Son of God. What he does is to begin his prologue with the section 13 verses long, of which the theme in a phrase is this, meet the cosmic divine logos, the word. Logos means argument. Logos means reason. When logos is translated word, that's the thought that lies behind the translation. Meet the cosmic divine logos, says John. And then he tells us straight away certain things about the logos. He's eternal. In the beginning was the word, verse 1. From eternity he was in communion with God. The word was with God. Eternally he was divine himself. The word was God. He was the Father's agent. He was God's agent in creation. All things were made through him. He is the immediate source of life in all its forms in this world that God has made through him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, verse 4. He, the Word, the Creator Word, came into the world, John continues, his coming was heralded by John the Baptist. Despite this, he was widely rejected when he came. He came to his own people. He came to his own world, rather, and his own people received him not. Those who did receive him, however, were blessed. He gave them the right, the privilege, the honor of becoming the sons of God. Those, namely, who believe on his name. Verse 12. And these things are all being said of the Logos, the Word. And as these wonderful and momentous things are said about the Word, John intends, he's calculating, that the interested reader will be asking with increasing urgency, who is this Word? I never heard of this Word before. Who is he? And then in verse 14... And on from verse 14 to verse 18, John answers that question by telling us who the word is. And if the, top, if, if the heading that sums up the thrust of the first 13 verses was the heading, Meet the Cosmic Divine Logos, the heading for verses 14 to 18, 18 is, Meet the Father's Incarnate Son. In verse 14, you come to the watershed, the momentous point in the, pre in the preface at which the identification is made. Look how it's done. The word became flesh, simple words with such profound meaning. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We've beheld his glory Glory, of course, is a word which speaks of the manifested presence of God. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Glory given by the Father to his only Son. That's the thought. And from this moment onward, we hear nothing about the word. From this moment onward, John talks consistently about the Son. Meet the Father's incarnate Son. He says that's who the Word is. The Word, remember, is divine, co-eternal with the Father, the Father's agent in creation, the Father's agent in bringing sons into the family, the agent that is in redemption. And this Word is the Son of the Father, and so one must think of him. And so, as I said, throughout the rest of the Gospel, we are taught to do. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. From his fullness have we all received grace upon grace. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There for the first time is his human name. And this is who Jesus Christ is. The Son of the Father whose glory we saw. You see the connections you see the identifications. The Word is the Son, 
The Son is Jesus Christ. And now we are tuned in to the theology of the Gospel of John. Now John, with wonderful skill, using simple words, has told us quite unambiguously who and what the, the man Jesus Christ is. And as you see, pre-existence, the pre-existence of the word, who is the son, is the point at which the story starts. I highlight this because the pre-existence of the son in personal fellowship with the father from, it, from all eternity has been challenged by some of our wise modern Christologists. It's a disastrous point to challenge, however, it's an essential point to affirm. If it's challenged, if it's lost, then immediately the truth of the Trinity has been abolished. That surely is plain. And you are shut up once more to the humanitarian Christology, which sees Jesus as a God indwelt man and denies the true incarnation. In such a book as John Robinson's The Human Face of God, there is deep confusion here, for Robinson challenges the personal pre-existence of the Savior, and yet Robinson believes that he's being loyal to the historic Trinitarian and incarnational faith of the church. It's the same confusion, in fact, as ran through his Honest to God 15 years ago. It's a very dangerous and damaging and destructive confusion indeed. But there it is. John's gospel is perfectly clear and explicit. And so is the second passage to which I want to refer you here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. That famous hymn, which Paul probably did not write. No one can be sure about that. But which certainly he makes his own by working it into the text of his letter to the Philippians and making its declarations part of his own argument. Have this mind among you which you have in Christ Jesus, he says, verse 5. Incidentally, that translation, which uh, is the Revised Standard Version, is, I'm sure, the correct one. Not have this mind among you which was or which you see, or whatever in Christ Jesus. No, the only natural way to render the Greek is have this mind among you, which you have in Christ Jesus, wrought in you already by virtue of your recreation through the Holy Spirit in his image. Now express it, says Paul, be what you are, and that's the thrust of the passage. And at this point, he launches into the hymn. Have this mind among yourselves, which you have, which is instinctive to you, one might almost say, in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, something to grab, something to grab and hang on to, seems to be the notion, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. It's a model of humility, giving yourself in a costly way for the sake of others. The word translated form in the phrase form of God signifies a form that is an appearance um, a set of outward characteristics which are a true clue, a genuine index to the nature of the thing whose form it is. These two items have the form of a microphone. Why so? Because they are microphones. So it would be appropriate if I were speaking Greek for me to use the word morphe when I say these two objects have the form of microphones. And when it's said that he was in the form of God, morphe means the same. He was God. This is the implication of the phrase. But for all that he was God, he emptied himself 
and took on him the form of a servant. Those two phrases expound each other. For eternal God, not to count equality with the Father a thing to grab and hang on to, but to, be, to take to himself the form of a servant is for him to empty himself of dignity and of glory and of honor. And that's what the phrase means. And so Paul goes on to explain it. He was born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself and went down even lower and became obedient unto death. Well, I mustn't stop on this passage. All that I want to do really from it is to underline the fact that it begins with an assertion of the pre-existence of the Son, and that's where the story starts. He was in the form of God, but from there he came down. That phrase, however, uh, he emptied himself at the beginning of verse 7, has already, I'm sure, made your minds move forward to think of the kenosis theory, which builds so much, or has in the past built so much on that phrase, and to the kenosis theory we must now move without more ado. So this is our third section. We shall examine the kenosis theory as a hypothesis about the incarnation to see how it measures up to the witness of Holy Scripture. Whence came this theory? From a group of 19th century Lutherans, And then from a number of English-speaking theologians who took up the Lutheran notion, uh, Bishop Gore, the, first, the pioneer liberal Catholic theologian in England, picked it up, first in his essay in the book Lux Mundi, and men like the Presbyterian theologian H.R. McIntosh and the Congregationalist theologian P.T. Forsyth and the Methodist theologian Vincent Taylor have also taken it up in more recent days. It's really a Trinitarian speculation, as you'll see, or Trinitarian hypothesis, shall I say, not to anticipate my verdict. It's an account of the divinity of the incarnate Son throughout his earthly life. Question, what is the theory? Answer. It's an assertion that, Jesus, that the deity of the incarnate Son, the deity of the man Christ Jesus, was reduced deity, shrunk deity, I will allow myself to say, through, um, in uh, throughout his earthly life, in consequence of a pre-incarnate decision whereby the so-called metaphysical attributes of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence were put in abeyance for the, for, the, for the period of the incarnate life. How exactly they were put in abeyance is explained differently by different theorists. We needn't bother, on, we needn't bother with that for the moment. Suffice it to say that that's the general idea. So that the Son of God who was born into this world and whose human name is Jesus, was never at any time omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent. So, whereas the Christian tradition sees Jesus Christ as God plus, that is, the Son of God in the fullness of his powers, acquiring through the incarnation a capacity for all forms of human experience without any diminution of his deity. And whereas the humanitarian Christology at which we looked yesterday says that Jesus was man plus man plus the indwelling, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, though he had no divine identity at any time, the kenosis theory says that, the, that Jesus Christ is God plus and minus. Minus certain capacities that had been his before, but plus 
all these new capacities for human experience uh, as Orthodox Christology affirms. And indeed, the suspicion which underlies the kenosis theory in all its exponents is that Jesus could not have entered fully into certain aspects of human experience had he not laid aside these divine powers in his glory before he took human nature to himself. And in saying this, I anticipate the answer to the next question I raise, why have men taken up with this theory? What has led them to it? The first answer to that question is that they believe that this hypothesis accounts for certain phenomena in the Gospels, which it's hard to account for on in any other terms, e.g., the limited knowledge which the man Jesus showed at certain points. Uh, I illustrate from the question he asked in the, in the story recorded Matthew, so, sorry, recorded in Mark 5.30, the story of the woman with the hemorrhage who crept up in the crowd and touched him and was in fact healed through touching him. And Jesus stopped and asked the question, who touched me? And the natural way of reading that is to suppose that at the moment of asking, he did not know. Uh, Bishop Gore wanted to develop it in this way. Jesus, in his view of the nature of Scripture, was no better, no different, uh, no better than and no different from any educated Jewish theologian of his own day. He assumed, for instance, the traditional authorship of Psalm 110, he quoted it as the word of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thy foes thy footstool. But said Bishop Gore, we know perfectly well that this is a Maccabean psalm dating from the second century BC and not written by, uh, not written by David at all. And so we must realize that from this bit of evidence that uh, Jesus simply didn't know. And at this point was the um, shall we say, the victim, certainly a sharer in the assumptions of his own day. Well, these phenomena, and others like them, so it's urged, are best accounted for by the supposition that Jesus had, had or the Son in his glory, the Son whose human name is Jesus, had laid aside his omniscience before he became man. Furthermore, Second reason for embracing this theory, it is argued that only on this view could Jesus have entered into all the experiences of limitation, which are part of what it means to be human, to know the limits of one's own knowledge, to know the limits of one's own power, to know that though one would like to be somewhere else at this present moment, one can't be. Had not the Son abandoned omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, well, he would not have known that limitation as being an integral part of his life. And this, so it's urged, is part of what it means to be human. And thirdly, it's urged by, or has been urged by the exponents of this theory that the thought of the Son actually freezing, abandoning, uh, parting from divine powers in this way gives more substance than ever to the thought of the great love and the great condescension that he showed when he became man for our salvation. It brings out, so they urge, part of the dimension of meaning in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He who was rich became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. These are the reasons that are given. I ask a third question now. We begin to test the hypothesis. Is there any scripture for this? Is there any direct biblical assertion of anything like this? Here I think our answer has to be no. As we saw a moment ago, Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, he emptied himself, is concerned with the abandoning of divine glory and dignity and honor, 
which was involved in his involved in the son's taking to himself the form of a servant to fulfill the pattern of Isaiah 53. And 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, he who was rich became poor that we through his poverty might be rich, is similarly speaking of the Savior coming down to earth in order to live as a poor man and die as a poor man, become an outcast and an outlaw in the society of his day. But there is no biblical assertion of the abandoning of the metaphysical attributes and indeed no biblical statement that I can find which shows the slightest interest in any such idea which shows or, or which suggests that any such notion had ever crossed a Bible writer's mind. No, this is a speculation. And I now raise a fourth question. Is it not, in fact, a very awkward speculation? Raising many new questions to which no good answer can be found and actually solving none when one looks at it again. Uh, I ask, is it not very audacious, this theory, in what it ventures to say about the psychology of God incarnate, the man Jesus? Granted, he did experience human limitations, no question about that, but is it really necessary to posit that he knew he couldn't know more than he did, that he knew he couldn't do other than he was doing, and so on and so forth, for him to have entered into those experiences? I'm going to suggest in a moment that it was not so necessary. I'm going to offer you in a moment an alternative hypothesis, which I believe to be more scriptural concerning those occasions when our Lord declared that he did not know uh, certain things. But for the moment, I limit myself to asking the question, isn't it audacious to affirm that he must have known that he couldn't? There were certainly things that he knew he could have done and didn't do. Matthew 26, 53 is an example don't you know that I could ask my father and he would send me more than 12 legions of angels? But I'm not doing that, says our Lord. I could, but I'm not going to. Is it really necessary to suppose that in the case of our Lord's not knowing certain facts, that the same doesn't apply? Well, return to that in a moment. Let me ask another question. Isn't this speculation audacious? in the way that it envisage, envisages the life of the divine trinity. What happened, we ask, to the cosmic functions of upholding the universe which he brought into being by the word of his power, those cosmic functions which are attributed to the Son of God in a number of the theological passages of scripture, one in Colossians 1, one in Hebrews 1, and so forth. What happened to the universe while the sun was on earth, devoid of his omnipotence and omniscience? Um, the late Archbishop Temple pressed this criticism. He says, in terms of the, the theory, what ought to have resulted was co would have been cosmic chaos. Vincent Taylor believes he knows the answer to that one. Surely, he says, the resources of the Trinity would be able to deal with this particular problem. But that's just a high-flown phrase, uh, a pontifical-sounding phrase, for convincing, for, for, uh, con which conceals, I'm sorry, which conceals this thought, uh, which I deliberately put in a colloquial way in order to bring it right down to earth that there was a, an agreement between the Father and the Son, or perhaps the Father and the Spirit and the Son, that the Father and the Spirit would take on the Son's job while the Son's, Son was away. Well, I know that when, for instance, a person like myself is away from college, a colleague may take some of uh, my lectures for me, but I must say I think it's very audacious and goes far beyond any scriptural warrant 
for supposing that similar things happen within the unity of the three in one. I think this is a mythological fant fantasy, if ever there was one, and I don't for myself buy it. I ask thirdly, isn't this notion op open to the criticism of being monophysitism in reverse? Do you know that word monophysitism? It's a heresy. It's the heresy that the Savior had only one nature and not two. Doesn't this theory so maim the Savior's deity that you cannot say that he was fully divine during his life on earth? I ask the question. I ask fourthly, isn't this hypothesis actually self-negating in this way? The supposition is that in order to enter into the fullness of human experience on earth, the son must renounce some of his divine powers. Question, what happens when the son returns to glory? The kenosis theorist is now confronted with a dilemma. He must say one or other of two things. Either he must say this, that the son regained those metaphysical attributes which hitherto he'd been without, in which case the problem arises at once, how can he be, how can his, exper his experience in glory be truly human? Or else he has to say that inasmuch as the Savior's experience always it continues truly human, he never gets those metaphysical attributes back at all. Forgive my down-to-earth language, but I believe that this is a dilemma on the horns of which the kenosis theorist is inescapably impaled, and I want to put it to you in a way which makes the point, or shall I say the points of the horns, just as sharp as possible. I think that uh, it's in the interests of clarity to do that. And neither horn of the dilemma seems to me to be in the least acceptable on kenotic principles. Though since I don't recognize the problem which the kenosis theory purports to solve, uh, the dilemma doesn't touch me. Um, I ask another question. Let's try now to be positive and constructive. Isn't there a better explanation of the limitations, the limited knowledge, for instance, which Jesus showed in the course of his earthly life. A better explanation, I mean, than the kenotic one. I believe that there is. Uh, to prepare the way for what I'm going to say, I ask you to remember that though there were times when Jesus showed professed ignorance of facts, there were also times when he exhibited supernatural knowledge. As when, for instance, he uh, saw Nathaniel under the fig tree, uh, when he foreknew um, Judas' betrayal and spoke of it very freely in John chapter 13 and elsewhere, and when he sh told the woman of Samaria that he knew all about the five husbands that, he that she'd had, although he'd never met her before, these facts also have to be explained and the explanation that we give must account for them as well as for the ignorances. Now, I search the scriptures and I read passages like this. Two words from the Lord himself. The first in John chapter 6, verse 57. I live by the Father. And again, his word in John chapter 5, verse 19. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. I ask, may not these words give a clue to the way that we should understand our Lord's testimony to limited knowledge when he was on earth? I, I suggest to you that the clue for understanding this is the reality of his dependence on the Father's will for all his acts at every level acts in eternity as the Father's agent in creation and then in upholding the word that he's made, and acts in time as the incarnate Son calling things to mind 
uh, or doing whatever corresponds to our mental act of calling things to mind, uh, knowing things, I mean, and acting, on, and acting on what he knows. I suggest to you that it's entirely congruous with the whole of the rest of the scripture witness to the son's dependence on the father for the whole of the life that he lives. That the son should not know, that is, should not have in mind what the father does not will at that moment that he should have in mind. In Mark chapter 13, verse 32, we have the confession of ignorance, which has caused perhaps the sharpest debate. Jesus is talking about the time of his return. And he says, of that day and that hour knows no man, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, only the Father. Are we to explain that in terms of the abandoning of omniscience by the Son prior to incarnation? Or are we to explain it in terms of the son knowing that it's not the father's will that he should have the date in his mind and therefore not having it there, just like that. The immediacy of G and completeness of Jesus' dependence on the father's initiative for his thoughts and his words and his acts is something which surely must be accounted another of the mysteries of the Godhead a reality which we confess without being able fully to comprehend. But that it is so, that there is this total dependence at every point, seems to me to be witnessed to by a great deal in the Gospels. And so I offer you this as an alternative explanation of the fact that there were times when Jesus did not have in mind uh, things which the omniscient Father certainly knew, and I recommend what I'm saying on the ground that, amongst other things, it accounts for those times when the incarnate Son did know and declare things which no one had told him and which, the, therefore, you have to say, he knew supernaturally. Both the supernatural knowledge and the awareness that uh, it was not the Father's will that he should have knowledge came from the same source. And in both cases, one sees the son knowing and doing what it's the father's will that he should know and do. This, I believe, is a better explanation of the data which prompted this theory in the first instance. And I think, too, that I can suggest a better explanation, a better answer, that is, to the question concerning the cosmic functions of the Son of God during the time of the Incarnation. Here again, I confess, I can, I'm offering you only a hypothesis, which you may think speculative. Nonetheless, it seems to me that it's preferable to that which, um, uh, that which the canonicists work with. It's a hypothesis that goes back at least to Athanasius. It's argued by Archbishop William Temple vigorously among the moderns, and he's not the only one. It is this that when the Son of God became man, his life, his uh, conscious, mental, personal, active life was conducted, as it were, from, temporally at least, from two centers of consciousness, one cosmic, one not, one incarnate, that is to say, so that he was, to use the phrase that Calvin used in expounding this notion, completely in, complete in the flesh and complete outside the flesh, totus incarni, totus extra carnem. It was indeed the Son continuing to uphold all things by the word of his power, but not as part of the personal mental life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. If you think that that, that 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 is altogether too speculative and I can't prove it, uh, I can only point to the fact that there's nothing in the picture of Jesus in the Gospels to suggest that part of his mental life had to do with the active upholding of all things uh, from, that, uh, uh, from where he was, so to speak, in Galilee at that time. 
uh, well, then I will very happily settle for the position that you will have to take, namely that this is a complete mystery and we would be wise not to make any attempt to understand how it could be. Just acknowledge from the scripture that it is and leave the matter there. But if it's a matter of speculation for speculation, I urge that this older hypothesis works better than does the canotic one, though we aren't bound to accept either. Well, this is the upshot of my examination of the kenosis theory. It is not proven by scripture. It is speculative. It's a speculation that creates new problems and leaves old problems unsolved. It's a speculation which I urge we cannot regard as satisfactory or pleasing at all. Quite apart from the handle that it gives to the skeptics who want to make use of it to, under, to outflank our Lord's testimony to the divine character of Holy Scripture. A very big point, surely, for all evangelical people. My argument is now at an end. I close with a simple rounding off remark about the divinity of Jesus and the gospel as presented to us in the whole coherent witness of the New Testament. From the New Testament, I wish to affirm as I close the rightness of the motive of those first kenoticists that, at least, was something in which they were right. They wanted to magnify, to glorify, to highlight the love, the divine love that was shown in the incarnation and the cross of the Son of God. In that, they were absolutely right. The Bible always points to the cross as the measure of the love, both of the Father and of the Son. And the message of Christ crucified is a message of unbelievable divine love, except unbelievable except that it's real, manifesting itself in incredible self-humbling and self-giving for our salvation. And I am bold to say this, much more objectionable than what I believe to be the kenotic misconception is the humdrum matter-of-fact acceptance of the incarnation and the cross, of which I fear some of us are guilty, that humdrum matter-of-fact acceptance of it, I mean, whereby we just put a mental tick against it, yes, that's true, that's fact, and we can think about it, and we can pass to and fro in our thinking alongside it, day after day, 